Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this seventh Sunday after Pentecost here at St. Paul's. It's lovely to see you all here this morning. My name is Lindsay Ross Hunt. I'm the associate rector here. Janny, as many of you know, is down in California packing up their house and family and um, they'll be back with us in a couple of weeks. So keep them in your prayers, please. Uh, let's take a moment before we get started to take a few deep breaths and to prepare ourselves for prayer. Blessed be the one holy and living God. God is love and we are God's children. There is no room for fear in love. We love because God loved us first. And together we pray, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you, no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord.
God be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from the book of Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time came to give birth, and it was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first one came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear it to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The psalm appointed this portion of 119. Let's read responsively by numbered verse. Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. I am deeply troubled. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. My life is always in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly, they are the joy of my heart. A reading from the letter to the Romans. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin He condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit 
set their minds on things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give you life to your, give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil, and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. 
Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while, and when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Grant us stillness of heart, O oh God, that we might have eyes to see and ears to hear the moving of your spirit among us this day. Amen. Amen. When our college students gather on Sunday evenings, we nearly always share a meal. And a few months ago, we were sitting around eating this lentil stew that I had made. And one of our crew shared that eating lentils always made him think of this story from Genesis and how that must have been some really amazing stew <laughs> to have convinced Esau to give up his birthright. I'm pretty sure Mine, while it was very good, would not have had the same effect. But it got me thinking, though, because if I was honest, I didn't really even know what that meant, to give up one's birthright. But I knew it was bad, because that much, I'd always thought, was clearly communicated in the story. It's an old story, and if it sounds a little absurd, that's because it is. Myths often are, and I mean that in the best possible way. Myths operate in a wondrous space that enables them to communicate deep truths. And this story is a part of the origin myth of the Hebrews, and by extension, as we are grafted into that story ourselves, this is how we began. It is a story of two brothers, twins, in a sequence of stories about brothers, Cain and Abel, Ishmael and Isaac, and now Esau and Jacob. We know that this will be a story of competition and conflict because those other stories are too. Or at least, that's how we've learned to hear them. And so the story begins, as it so often does in these origin stories of God's people, with a barren woman who suddenly finds herself with child, or children, as the case may be, as there are two children in her womb and they are throwing a fit. The conflict has begun already. And so Rebecca, one of the most remarkable matriarchs we have in the Hebrew Bible goes directly to God herself and asks, what is going on? God tells her that there are two nations fighting in her womb, that they will be divided and one will serve the other. And so the children are born 
and they couldn't be more different. One loves to hunt, the other prefers to stay quietly at home. One is loved by their father and the other by their mother. One day, we're told, Esau comes home, exhausted and famished from all of his hunting. And Jacob has made a stew. And Esau asks him for some. Jacob replies that he'll give him a bowl, but only on the condition that Esau give him his birthright. Esau was technically the eldest since he came out first. Did Esau think his brother Jacob was just pulling his leg? And couldn't nobody at 830 got that one. Well done. Or was he honestly so starved that he thought he wouldn't be around anyway to enjoy that birthright without his brother's lentil stew? We don't know for sure why Esau agrees to this sneaky bargain, and only that he does so, and so despises his birthright, which, to clarify, is his two-thirds portion of the inheritance as opposed to his brother's one-third. There are so many archetypes in this story. Rebecca is barren, there are two brothers, and they're at odds, their parents are divided over which one they love. And all of that makes sense when you think of this as an origin story. Jacob and Esau are part of a larger story about the, how the Israelites came to be as a people. In fact, Jacob's name will ultimately be changed by God to Israel. And often in the Bible, when God is referring to Israel, God will use the name Jacob instead. This is a story being told by a people of how they understood themselves to come to be. We all have these kinds of stories. Our families, our towns, our churches. We're hearing them here at St. Paul's this summer as we celebrate our founding 140 years ago. And over time, these stories warp and shift and different parts get emphasized and others forgotten. And that's not to say that any of that is unimportant or untrue, but rather how we tell the story communicates certain ideas and values. And more often than not, when we tell our origin stories, we tend to see ourselves and our ancestors as the heroes of those stories, rightfully or not. It's critical to pay attention to this in our own histories. And it's particularly important to pay attention to it in our sacred texts. In her book, A Year of Biblical Womanhood, author Rachel Held Evans writes, if you are looking for verses in the Bible with which to support slavery, you will find them. If you are looking for verses with which to abolish slavery, you will find them. If you are looking for verses with which to oppress women, you will find them. If you are looking for verses with which to liberate or honor women, you will find them. If you are looking for reasons to wage war, you will find them. If you are looking for reasons to promote peace, you will find them. If you are looking for an outdated, irrelevant, ancient text, you will find it. If you are looking for truth, believe me, you will find it. This is why there are times when the most instructive question to bring to the text is not, what does it say, but what am I looking for? I suspect Jesus knew this when he said, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be opened. If you want to do violence in this world, you will always find the weapons. If you want to heal, you will always find the balm. 
So often, we hear these stories in terms of competition, conflict, and chosenness. But is that the only way to hear them? I don't think so. I am a deep, deep lover of Holy Scripture, and rarely would I say that it is clear. Part of what makes it so rich and beautiful is the many myriad layers to it. How might we hear this story differently? How might we begin to unpeel the centuries of interpretation read into the text? And what might it have to offer us in our own world today? So at the beginning of this homily, I suggested that the archetype of the two brothers sets us up for thinking that this is a story of conflict. And that may be true. And maybe we have read that into the story more than it's actually there, particularly God's endorsement of it. When God speaks to Rebecca, our translation reads, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The elder shall serve the younger. But there are two sticky things with this translation. And, and Fred can, can correct me if I'm wrong here later at coffee hour, so check in with Fred. The first is that the word translated as divide also means spread. In other words, two people born of you shall spread, as in disperse. And in the arc of a story that is about how God's people came to move into and populate a land, this translation makes perhaps just as much sense as these brothers being divided. And the second bit of the phrase translated, the elder shall serve the younger, the Hebrew grammar here is odd. And it could also be translated as the elder, the younger shall serve. The Hebrew itself is ambiguous. It could be read either way. Built into the text is tension and ambiguity. History has tended to read a moral binary into this story. Esau despised his birthright, after all. The readers of this story would have identified with Jacob and he is, as he is the one through whom their own, our own, story is traced. And yet, in the story itself, the moral binary is not so clear. God only appears at the beginning of the story. Two nations are in your womb but does not appear to render judgment on either Jacob or Esau. And yet we are quick to do so. But what does any of that have to do with us today? Why am I subjecting you to 15 minutes this morning rehashing the mythic story of two brothers from the other side of the world? This story is a part of our own origin story. And whether we acknowledge it or not, it continues to inform the way we understand difference in our world. In a very direct way, this still frames the conflict which we'll hear about from Father Diab when he visits this week. Do we see ourselves in essential competition and conflict with others? Or is it possible that we might envision a world where differences could coexist not simply tolerantly, but respectfully and with love. We'll spend the next month with Jacob's story. Esau disappears from the lectionary after this week, but not from the Bible. Jacob will trick his father into giving him his blessing instead of Esau, and the rift between them will grow. It will grow until many years later when Jacob returns to his homeland with his very extensive family. And they will be terrified of what awaits them when they see Esau after all Jacob has done. They will anticipate violence. And what will happen instead is grace. 
a great embrace of one another with tears of joy and exchange of stories and life missed. How might we envision a different world? One in which competition and conflict are not the default lens, but rather coexistence and cooperation, where reconciliation and restoration are possible. This is the radical vision that Jesus lived and died for, love of God and neighbor, right relationship. How might we, as we pray in today's collect, know and understand those things we ought to do and have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them? Perhaps the invitation buried beneath our gospel reading this morning is not simply to spread seeds of God's kingdom in the world, but also to cultivate good, rich soil within ourselves, the kind of soil that can grow understanding and love, the kind of soil that can enable us to see others who are different from us, not in terms of conflict or competition, but as kin. Amen. Let us together confess the faith of the church as it has been handed down to us in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God. Brothers, sisters, siblings in Christ, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. By that same Spirit, let us pray, saying, Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of our lips, and teach us your judgments. God of our ancestors, we pray that divided nations be united and warring nations find peace. May we recognize that we are created by your will and are all members of one human family. We pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, for Michael, the presiding bishop, for Melissa, our bishop, 
Brian, our assisting bishop, Joe, our president, and Jay, our governor, for our clergy and vestry and their leadership of our parish. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of our lips. Great God, may the word of your kingdom find good soil in your church. Cause your word to grow in our hearts and bear an abundance of fruit. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of our lips. God of the harvest, bless the seeds and soil of the world. Give us the wisdom to bring forth its yield wisely and according to your will, that all people may have enough to eat. We pray for our special thanksgivings. And those thanksgivings we now name. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of our lips. Caring God, we are deeply troubled by the violence in our communities. May all who set their minds on death, even now, be converted to the spirit of life and peace. We pray our special concerns, especially for Chris, Aaron, Jada and Judy, Molly, Brian, Chuck and Linda, John, Karen, Harry and Cindy, Dave and Dot, Zachary, and those we now name. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of our lips. Healing God, preserve the lives of the suffering and sick according to your word. Speak joy into the hearts of the sorrowful. We pray especially for Carrie, Dana, Sidsel, David, Paul, Ruth, Karen, Warren, Josh, Suji, Kent, Debbie, Dee, Mary and Gisela, Jim and Sue, and those we now name. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of our lips. Eternal God, you preserve all who are in Christ Jesus from condemnation. By the resurrection of your Son, we trust that in the fullness of time, you will give life to our mortal bodies through his Spirit, which dwells in us. We pray for those who have died, especially for Harriet Green, Ian Stanford, Molly Lindsay, Frank Byford, and those we now name. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of our lips. God of grace and compassion, you know our prayers even before we ask. Yet in asking, we open ourselves and our hearts to your presence and guidance. Answer our prayers according to your will. We call on you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God.
God of all mercy. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. Good morning, good morning. Go ahead and have a seat. We've got some announcements. Um, a special welcome to you all if you're worshiping at home with us online, um, especially to those who are new-ish or visiting with us this morning. Uh, if you uh, look in the pew back in front of you, there's a little card. and. Um, if, you want to, if you're interested in learning more about the life of the congregation, if you want to talk to a staff or a clergy person, you can fill that out and drop it in the offering plate as it goes by or hand it to one of the ushers on your way out. We would love to connect with you. Um, you may have noticed in the prayers, um, we had a lot of deaths this past week, um, particularly in this congregation, um, Harriet Green and Molly Lindsay. Molly died yesterday. Uh, please be keeping their families, particularly Brian and Jacob and Florence, in your prayers as they navigate this time. I don't know anything about funerals yet, um, but as soon as we do, we will get that out to folks. Um, so be holding them in prayer. Ed. Good morning. My name's Ed Sugar. 16 days from today is what? Yeah, how many of you have tickets already? Well, bless the people who've already purchased tickets. You did us a big favor. We've met our commitment to the Bells. We don't owe them any more money, which means two things. One, we still have plenty of voucher meal uh, tickets at $23.50. You may purchase them by either uh, putting a check and donation in the plate or online. Just let us know it's for the baseball game so it doesn't go off to general fund or something. Makes it a lot easier. But the big news is because we've met our commitment, we now can open up general admission tickets. This is for those of you who might be on a budget. You might have, say, six or seven kids in your family. You want to bring them to the game. Guess what? General admission on this, because we're on a Tuesday night, five fifty per person. You can buy those directly from the bell, go online, put in the passcode Tuesday, because it's Tuesday, you'll get your 550 seats. If not, you may purchase them through us. Just let me know how many 550 tickets and 2350 tickets you have. Please do not give Diane and, and Claire and I this big number that we have to figure out, dividing by 550 and 23, what works in. Make it less confusing for us, please. We'll again have more information in the weeks to come, but we'll see you in 16 days at Joe Martin. Thank you, Ed. Hi, I'm Amelia. I'm one of your vestry members, and along with Connie and Michelle, who are on the vestry, we've been planning small group dinners. Um, it, it, the link to sign up to be a guest at, one, at another parishioner's home is in your newsletter. It's also on page 14. There's a QR code. So what you do with that is you turn your phone camera on. You've probably done this for a menu. And then when it's seeing the code, it will ask you if you want to open a link. And that link is a very short 
sign up with your name and then which dates you're available. Um, we, we would love to have an eclectic mix of many people from across our parish that we can pair with hosts who want to have you over for a meal. And there's no program, it's just a simple way to connect and I hope you'll take advantage of that. Uh, they're, they're coming up, so it'd be great if you could sign up today or tomorrow or this week. Thank you. Thanks, Amelia. Um, that's, that initiative coming out of the vestry is part of um, one of the focus areas for the vestry this year in terms of cultivating increased opportunities for fellowship and connection, which came directly out of our profile um, as we were searching for a new rector. So um, hope that you take advantage of that opportunity. B. And then I'm, I, think, I think we have a shared announcement, so I'll let you go first. If I miss anything, let me know. <laughs> um, hi there. Uh, so as you may know, uh, Friar Diab will be coming here next week, which is super exciting. But what you may not know is that his son, Andrew, is also going to be here with us. Andrew is teenage, I believe. And so if you have a youth who is interested in learning a bit more about uh, what it is like to be a young Christian in that part of the world, I would love if you would come by. We have a Q&A with Andrew on Wednesday. It's going to be at 6 after the dinner. And if you are a youth, uh, I encourage you to come, bring a friend. We will have snacks if you want snacks. I know that can be a big sell. Um, there will be snacks, and I hope you'll join us. And if I missed anything, let me Thank you, B. Yeah, so, so Father Diab will be here on uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Wednesday, uh, he'll join us for dinner at 6 p.m. The Bishop's Task Force on Peace and Justice in the Holy Land is preparing us an amazing dinner. I think there may be lentil stew. Was there lentil <laughs> stew? <laughs> I think maybe. Um, but I hope that, uh, that, so we'll have dinner, and then afterwards, um, Father Diab and his wife will be uh, hosting a conversation to, for, for folks to hear about what life is like for Palestinian Christians in the Holy Land. Um, and it's a really unique opportunity to get to hear and talk with folks who are experiencing that firsthand without having to travel halfway across the world. Um, so I hope that you'll take advantage of this opportunity. Wednesday night, 6 o'clock for dinner, conversation afterwards, and then Thursday morning, uh, Father Diab will be uh, presiding uh, at our 10 a.m. Eucharist. So uh, if you can't make it on Wednesday but want to join for Eucharist on Thursday, that is an option as well. Any other announcements? I think that's it. I hope that's it. I forgot to write them down. Oh, well. If, uh, if I missed anything, it'll be in the newsletter. Um, all right, through their birthdays or anniversaries, we can celebrate today. Yeah, if you have a birthday or an anniversary, go ahead and stand up. All right. Patty. All right, birthday on Friday. Joy. Yay. Joy. Birthday today. All right. Wonderful. All right, let's, um, and I'm totally lost in my bulletin here. All right, let's, uh, let's pray for these dear ones. Together, the, the prayer is found on page 8. Watch over your servants, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their heart, may your peace, which passes all understanding, abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor to God.
All things come from you, O oh God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. You have filled us and all creation with your blessing and fed us with your constant love. You have redeemed us in Jesus Christ and knit us into one body. Through your spirit, you replenish us and call us to fullness of life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us, and so we violated your creation abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters, sons, and children, that with Paul and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. through Christ, and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. 
And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say in the language of our hearts, our Father in heaven. The gifts of God for the people of God. All are welcome at God's table.
Please stand as you are able. Gracious God, we ask that you empower Anne and Pug and Lucy in the name of this congregation to bear today's scripture and these holy gifts to Rabina Page. We pray that this sacrament may bring them all of God's healing power and that they are one with us in the body of Christ. In Christ's name we pray. We who are many are one body because we all share one bread, one cup. Amen. Let us pray. God of abundance, Friends, life is short, and we don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk this way with us. So be swift to love, and make haste to be kind, and may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you and remain with you always. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit.